Welcome back, everybody, to the second to last video in our reaction on the Napoleonic Wars by Epic History TV. So, we're almost at the end now. This is the Battle of Waterloo, which, as everyone knows, is the culmination of the Napoleonic Wars. But also, we've got a video after this, which many people have recommended that I also do a reaction to, which is um, their sort of compen uh, compendium video to this, which is a video on Napoleon's marshals. Um, I've spoken... Um, at length about some of Napoleon's marshals throughout um, the series and I've kind of touched on the fact that Napoleon's marshals were just as instrumental in the success of the French Empire as Napoleon himself was. Um, so a lot of people have recommended that I also watch that video too, which we're going to do. Um, just a quick point on this video before we start, so it's been brought to my attention by several people, I didn't know this before, but some people have pointed out that this was actually the, the first video that Epic History TV did before they did all of the other videos in the Napoleonic Wars series. So this video, they've said, um, isn't sort of, it, it's, you know, it's lacking perhaps some of the production quality that some of the more uh, later videos had, which is fine, you know, that's to be expected, we all improve with time. At least I hope so, anyway. Um, I hope I do. Um, so just bear that in mind as we react to this as well. So um, just a couple of points, as always, before we start. If you like what I do, please leave a like and make sure you subscribe because there's reaction content every Wednesday and Friday. Um, I was recently um, on holiday in the United States for a couple of weeks. Um, I've been back a couple of weeks now, but I'm just sort of in... I went out there to see my partner and I'm just um, sort of in that post... Uh, holiday blues state at the minute so I've not really worked on anything to do with the channel um, in the past two weeks that I've been back so um, but I do have some original content lined up so hopefully in the next few weeks I'll get that edited and I'll get it put out it's just that I absolutely hate editing so one of the main reasons I do these reaction videos is that they are very minimal in editing they take like five minutes tops to edit because all I need to do is just chop out the unneeded audio. Um, I don't need to like line things up or find clips and find pictures and things like that. So um, editing is something that I really, really do not like. Um, so that's why original content tends to take me a bit longer. So, um, but just keep in mind for that, there will be some original content coming out. Um, as this is a uh, spooky month, I will also be doing some Halloween specials later in the month, um, towards the end um, in the run-up to Halloween. It may be, uh, depending on how many videos I can find to react to, um, it may be that there will just be a special on Halloween itself, or I might do some um, a full week of specials, you know, in the week leading up. So the, um, the Wednesday and the Friday before Halloween, um, maybe sort of Halloween themed videos or at least something, you know, kind of spooky uh, related to history. So, um, you know, it could be. Um, so if anyone has any ideas for those, please do let me know if anyone knows of any videos like that. I've been sort of searching for like spooky history content, you know, something that, you know, um, things that are kind of eerie, you know, uh, some things I had in mind would be something like the Lost Colony of Roanoke or um, you know, the Marie Celeste, something like that. So if anyone knows of any uh, good videos on some sort of spooky ha um, Halloween history content, then please let me know and I'll definitely take a look. Um, but in the meantime, uh, let's just dive straight in. So this is the culmination of the Napoleonic Wars. This is the Battle of Waterloo. April 1814. For 10 years, one man has dominated Europe. Napoleon Bonaparte, Emperor of the French. Under his military genius, France conquered an empire that spanned the continent. But finally, he has been defeated by a grand coalition of his enemies. Napoleon is forced to abdicate and exiled to the tiny island of Elba. Yeah, when they did that, the, uh, the coalition let him keep the title of Emperor of Elba. You know, and I'm sure they got a big laugh out of doing that because, you know, I get why they why they did it because you know it was kind of like they they didn't want to sort of trammel another monarchy so far because if you remember the whole reason that this war started in the first place was in part because of the execution of the French king, 
um, so they perhaps didn't want to kind of rock the boat too far. So they were just like, let it, let's let him keep the title of emperor at least, you know, because we don't want to be seen to be usurping a monarchy, so to speak, because that's why this whole war started to begin with. But I can't help but think that this was done as a slight, you know, it was just this tiny island off the Italian coast. Oh, let's let him keep the title of emperor of this small island. You know, you can't help but think that that was deliberate. While the Bourbon monarchy is restored to France in the corpulent form of Louis XVIII. But rumors soon reach Napoleon that France would welcome his return. The French people have little love for the monarchy or its hangers on. The very people whose excesses led to the French Revolution 25 years before. Yeah, and when the Bourbon so when the Bourbon monarchy actually was restored um, after the coalition forces took Paris, you remember from the last video when the coalition forces entered Paris, they were welcomed as liberators because France had toiled in war for the better part of a quarter of a century at this point. Um, you know, he had seen hundreds of thousands of his young men being sent to die under um, for Napoleon's conquests. By the end of it, they just wanted Napoleon gone. You know, they were ready to return to the Bourbon monarchy, but as soon as the Bourbon monarchy was restored, they were kind of reminded why they got rid of them in the first place. So it just shows that how, you know, public opinion, by and large, is very, very fickle. You know, it can change very quickly. You know, the slightest thing can make it shift. Um, and it's just whatever sort of benefits the population at large at, at that time. So, sure, by, the t by 1814, they were wanting Napoleon gone. They were just ready to, you know, return to the Bourbon monarchy. But the Bourbon monarchy comes back, and they're kind of reminded of the excesses of the French aristocracy. And then they're kind of, they kind of like start shifting, not all of them, but um, a lot of them start shifting opinion again. And they think, oh, this is where we got rid of him. You know, maybe it wasn't so bad after all. So there is a lot of like shifting of public opinion at this time in France. He also learns that at the Congress of Vienna, his enemies are locked in bitter dispute over the future of Europe. Napoleon decides to act. After just 10 months in exile, he returns to France, where the troops sent to arrest him rally to his cause instead. Most of France soon follows suit. But in Vienna, the coalition immediately put their differences to one side. They declare Napoleon an outlaw and mobilize their forces for war. Napoleon knows he must act boldly before... Just one small thing to note about that as well is that the coalition, all the coalition forces, they all declared war, but not on France. They declared war on Napoleon himself. You know, and I think that just shows just how much of a threat that everybody viewed him. That they... And I think... Correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know for sure, I don't know if this for certain, but I think this is probably the first time and possibly the only time in history that war was declared on a single individual. Because they didn't declare war on France, they didn't declare war on the French people or the French army or anything like that. They declared war on one man, you know. And up until this point, whenever war was declared, it was always one nation against another. Britain declares war on France, you know, Spain declares war on Austria, something like that. It was never Britain declares war on, you know, it, for example, in the... Um, War of 1812, for example, between Britain and the United States, you know, the United States didn't declare war on King George III, you know, or something like that. They declared war on Britain. They declared war on a nation. So what this is essentially saying is that the French people, the, even the French troops, we have no quarrel with you. Our quarrel is with Napoleon himself. Before the coalition launches a coordinated invasion of France, he counts on winning a quick victory and then negotiating peace. Just as another quick aside, sorry for interrupting so much, but um, some people may be wondering what this is because we've already got the British flag here, the uh, Union flag, as it's more properly known. It's the, usually only the Union Jack when it's flown from a jack staff on a ship, um, but most people know it is the Union Jack, and Union Jack is technically correct as well. He's been accepted as correct for so long. Um, but there's this flag over here. This is the ensign of the Royal Navy, um, and it still is the... They're the same today as well. So that this is the flag that's flown from Royal Navy ships. From a position of strength, 
He targets the coalition armies within easiest reach. Prince Blücher's Prussian army and the Duke of Wellington's Anglo-Allied army, both camped in Belgium. Napoleon's force is a match for either coalition army on its own, but he'll be heavily outnumbered if they're able to join forces, so he must keep them apart and defeat each in turn. Napoleon's army crosses the frontier near Charleroi, intending to drive a wedge between the two coalition armies. The next day, Napoleon sends his left wing under Marshal Ney to take the crossroads at Quatre Bras. There, Ney clashes with Wellington's army, still scrambling into position. The Allied troops fight off a series of French attacks and just manage to hold their ground. The same day, Napoleon attacks Blücher's Prussian army with his main force near the village of Ligny. The battle is a brutal slugging match, but the French emerge triumphant. The 72-year-old Blücher leads a cavalry charge in person and has his horse killed under him. He only just escapes capture. The Prussian army retreats, but it is not broken. Napoleon sends his right wing under Marshal Grouchy to keep them on the run and turns his own attention to Wellington's army. The British general doesn't receive news of Blücher's defeat until the next morning, at which point he orders a retreat through heavy summer showers to a position eight miles south of Brussels, near the village of Waterloo. There, he receives a promise from Blücher that the Prussians will march to his aid the next morning. So Wellington decides to stand and fight. Wellington has chosen his battlefield with care. His troops are behind a gentle ridge, which will give them some shelter from French cannon fire. More importantly, too, so this was actually one of Wellington's sort of signature tactics, which was hiding his troops on what's called the reverse slope. So when you get to the crest of a hill and it starts to slope on the other side, that's where he positions most of his troops. Because for one thing, not only does it keep them sheltered from French cannon fire, and you remember at the time um, of the Napole Napoleonic Wars, the French artillery was the best in the world at the time. You know, the Wellington didn't really have much of an opinion of his own artillery, but he gave them strict orders not to engage in counter-battery fire because he knew if his artillery was to duel the French artillery, the French artillery would likely win um, because they were just better at it. They were just better trained, better experienced. Napoleon was a big advocate for artillery himself, being an artillery officer. Um, so... Um, the French artillery was always superior, so any way that they could minimize the casualties and the damage from French artillery, the better. So by hiding his troops on the reverse slope, um, it minimizes those losses, but it also conceals his movements from the enemy. So he can move troops to where, wherever he needs them, and the enemy doesn't particularly know what's going on because they can't see. They can't see over the hill. Um, so it gives him sort of that element of um, freedom to maneuver without necessarily being caught out in the act, so to speak. Um, also, just one thing to quickly note, cause I don't know if the video is going to touch on this or not, but um, Wellington has around sort of just shy of 70,000 troops with him at Waterloo. Um, it's worth noting that only about 23,000 of those were British, and of those, only 7,000 were actually veterans of the Peninsula War. Most of the troops at Waterloo were pretty green. They were pretty fresh troops. Um, Wellington himself commented on that in a letter before the Battle of Waterloo itself. He was, you know, lamenting the fact that this, you know, his staff officers were very inexperienced. You know, most of the troops were fresh. Um, the cavalry arm in particular. Um, so by this time, French cavalry had been pretty much exhausted from decades of constant warfare. So the um, British cavalry regiments, which would go on to be quite famous in this battle, particularly the Scots Greys and the Union Brigade and things like that, they would have the best mounts, the best horses of any cavalry regiment on the field. 
but he still didn't hold them in particularly high regard because he noted that they had a tendency to sort of charge impetuously, you know, without holding back reserves or particularly, you know, analysing the situation very tactically. They just had a tendency to just charge straight at the enemy, you know, and didn't really think about what was going on. And that was the kind of cavalier attitude that defined even as far back as the English Civil War. You know, English cavalry tended to have that reputation. Um, so this army was pretty ramshackle. So most of the arm, the bulk of the army was actually troops from um, places like the Netherlands or Belgium, you know, or uh, certain German states. And most of them as well, Wellington was kind of suspicious of them because up until very recently, nations like Belgium and the Netherlands were under French control. You know, both nations have, particularly Belgium, uh, even today, has a very, very large French-speaking population. Um, and most of those were, you know, sort of quite sympathetic towards Napoleon. Most of the troops um, that Wellington had with him had until recently <laughs> fought with the French. So there was very mixed opinion about what, you know, whether these troops were particularly reliable or not. So the the reason why Wellington didn't have his Peninsula War veterans with him was because in 1812, the United States had declared war on Britain for a multitude of reasons. And um, when war finally concluded in 1814, people and Napoleon was exiled to Elba, people thought, finally, this is over. And Britain had sent most of its veteran troops into North America to fight, not knowing that um, just a few months later the war would be concluded anyway. You know, in a treat the Treaty of Ghent ended the War of eighteen twelve. Sort of, I believe it was late in eighteen fourteen. Um, but news of that wouldn't reach America for if, uh, quite a few quite a few weeks after. So fighting still continued, but. Um, Britain had thousands of its veterans in North America that it, you know, would it would take weeks to ship them back, you know, and even longer to deploy them. So, you know, he couldn't count on his Peninsula War veterans um, to help him here. So a very small number of the troops at Waterloo on um, Wellington's side had actually seen combat before. So um, it was a as he was late, you know, one of the famous quotes that he would say is that the Battle of Waterloo is a very near run thing. And this is why, because most of the troops were inexperienced, potentially unreliable. Um, some of them hadn't even seen action before. So it was kind of a miracle that he held on as long as he did. His right flank is anchored on the farmhouse of Hougoumont, his center on the farm of La Haye Sainte, and his left on the farm of Papillotte. All three are fortified and garrisoned with elite troops. Wellington's men need every advantage they can get. The opposing armies are roughly equal in size, but his is a ragtag mix of British, Dutch and German troops, many of whom have never seen combat before. They will have to hold off Napoleon's army of veterans until Prussian reinforcements arrive or the battle, and probably the war, will be lost. I did notice I said it was about 23,000 troops were British, um, but it says there that Wellington had 31,000 British troops. I believe I was just counting actual British troops because there was a substantial number of German troops that were fighting under uh, British colours at the Battle of Waterloo. These were known as the King's German Legion, and I think there were several thousand of those at Waterloo. So um, I think actual... British British troops, I think there was about 23,000, but there were several thousand from the King's German Legion. Sunday dawns bright and fair. Napoleon has ordered Marshal Grouchy to pursue the Prussians and keep them busy, while he defeats Wellington's army at Waterloo and opens the road to Brussels. But it's Grouchy who gets pinned down, fighting the Prussian rearguard at Wavre. The main Prussian force eludes him and is already marching to Wellington's aid. Yeah, um, there was a very famous order given by Blücher as well, which is he, he was said to have ordered his troops march to the sound of the guns. Um, i.e. march to the sound of the artillery fire that you can hear and that's where they're fighting. Um, 
and you know he really drove his army hard to get there as well it was essentially a force march but thank god he did as well because that was the the decisive factor that swung the battle i think had Blucher not shown up um there's a very real chance that wellington could have been beaten at waterloo um but also i think had he not been the best outcome he could have hoped for was um a draw pretty much the same thing that happened at Caterbra. so um definitely very close run at waterloo napoleon delays his attack waiting for the ground to dry which will make movement easier for his troops but the lost hours will later prove costly. The battle begins around 11 a.m., when Napoleon orders a feint against Wellington's right flank at Hougoumont. He hopes Wellington will commit his reserves here, drawing them away from the center where the main blow will fall. But Hougoumont's British and German defenders cling on desperately throughout the day. At one point, the French force their way through the main gate, but it's shut behind them. And yeah, even though this was only intended as a feint, Hugomon, over the course of the day, becomes just this sort of black hole for French troops. More and more French troops get poured into it, um, even though it's only a feint. So it, that's actually drawing even more French troops away from what could be the main attack against Wellington Center. And you remember, this is actually a signature Napoleon move, you know, which is faint on the flanks because the flanks are the most vulnerable part of an army. But what his thinking is, is let's threaten the flanks so they reinforce them because you don't want your flanks overturned. But that then leaves um, other parts of the line vulnerable, which we can then punch through and split the army in two. You know, that's always been Napoleon's signature move is divide and conquer, essentially. Um, but this, you know, the Hugomon never falls either throughout the course of the day, and it just becomes this vacuum just sucking in more and more French troops. Um, and they never quite manage to threaten it severely enough to sort of weaken uh, Wellington's line enough for them to actually break through. So, um, yeah, and the, the other reason why um, it was launched on this flank as well is because Ugomon Farm was the only part of Wellington's line that Napoleon could see clearly. You know, there was other par other portions of his line at, um, that were kind of like obscured by the rolling ground and obviously the bulk of Wellington's army Napoleon couldn't see at all because it was behind the hill. Um, so Hugomon Farm was the only part of the line that he could actually see clearly so he could actually coordinate a proper assault on it. So that's also the other reason why it kind of became this magnet. And the intruders are all killed. Wellington later calls it the decisive moment of the battle. Around noon, 80 French cannon open fire against the main Allied line. Most of Wellington's men are out of sight on the reverse slope, but many cannonballs still find their mark, smashing bloody holes in the Allied ranks. At 1.30 p.m., Napoleon sends in his infantry. The French columns are met by disciplined musket fire and then charged by British heavy cavalry. The French attack disintegrates as Napoleon's men try to save themselves from the crushing hooves and flashing sabres. Scores of Frenchmen are ridden down and two of their famous Eagle standards are captured. But the British cavalry, exhilarated by success, charge too far. They become scattered, their horses blown. At their most vulnerable, they're countercharged by French cavalry and suffer terrible losses. Among the dead, Major General Sir William Ponsonby, commander of the Union Brigade. Yeah, that's kind of like what I was alluding to earlier, was saying that the, the Allied cavalry, uh, at this time, it was the best equipped in Europe by far, um, but it was just so impetuous. And this is a precise um, example of, of of that kind of mindset because yes these cavalry charges they saved the allied line for sure um they did severe damage to the french army you know they destroyed several regiments they, they took two eagles which is a huge embarrassment for the french army at this time um they you know scattered a lot of artillery as well 
um, but in turn they end up being destroyed themselves. So, um, you know, and this is exactly, you know, what um, Wellington was afraid of because he knew that his cavalry was hot-headed. So, and there's actually a great scene, if anyone's seen the film Waterloo with Christopher Plummer as Wellington, and there's actually a great scene in that when he's sounding the recall, you know, he's got a, a bugler next to him and he's constantly blowing the recall to have the cavalry come back and it's just not working. They just can't either can't hear him or ignoring him. And he keeps blowing this the same notes over and over again. And at some at one point Wellington just kind of snaps, he's like, Stop that useless noise. And then he realizes that he's been kind of harsh on him. And he's just like, You'll hurt yourself. <laughs> so um yeah, it's a big moment in that film as well. Um, if anyone's seen um that movie, uh, when the cavalry charge, there's a really famous scene where it kind of recreates the famous painting as well. There's the chart, I think it's called Scotland Forever, the painting, and it's the charge of the uh, Royal Scots Greys, I think they're called, um, which was one of the elite cavalry regiments in the British Army. And um, there's a moment in the movie as well, which kind of recreates that painting where it's the cavalry charge in slow motion. It's actually, it's actually really good, you know, if. Uh, if anyone wants um, wants a decent movie about the Battle of Waterloo, that is a good one to watch. Around 4 p.m., Marshal Ney thinks he sees the Allies begin to retreat and leads a mass cavalry charge to drive home the advantage. But Ney is wrong. The Allied infantry are ready, formed in hollow squares with bayonets fixed. What he likely saw was Allied wounded being taken to the rear, but he missed, He mistakes that um, as the Allied army actually retreating. So he launches this mass cavalry assault, and launching cavalry alone against infantry, especially infantry that's well dug in, um, formed in squares, is suicidal. You know, um, one of the tenets of launching cavalry attacks like this is that you didn't launch them unsupported. You only generally launch cavalry against other enemy cavalry to drive them away, or you launch cavalry at already broken troops, you know, to pursue them and run them down. You never launch cavalry at well entrenched troops because it's just disastrous. Um, you never do it without the support of other infantry and, and artillery of your own. And that's what Ney does. He launches just cavalry. He launches them without infantry and without artillery support. And every single one of these French charges is repelled. You know, it's almost like the Battle of Crecy, you know, in 1346. It's that kind of same um, thing where they launched, you know, repeated charges against um, well-defended and well-entrenched um, positions. And it just, they just end up losing every time. I think there's something like 11 cavalry charges throughout the day until Ney finally realizes his mistake and he sends up infantry and artillery in support. The French cavalry can't break into these impregnable formations. They can only circle impotently until they retreat or are shot from the saddle. Ney's failure to support this attack with either infantry or artillery is a serious blunder. Yeah, I didn't realize he was going to say that, but... Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what I was getting at. Meanwhile, Blücher's Prussians have begun to arrive. They capture the village of Plancenoit, threatening Napoleon's flank and forcing him to send reserves to recapture it. Around 6 p.m., French infantry finally capture the farmhouse of La Haye Sainte in the center of the battlefield. It allows the French to bring forward artillery and blast the Allied squares from close range. They can't miss the closely packed formations and casualties quickly mount. One of the big vulnerability of squares as well, they have to stay in square because of the cavalry threat. But what that means is that they're completely vulnerable to French infantry and artillery, and these squares just get blown to pieces. You know, Wellington his, himself was trapped in one of them. You know, many thought that he was going to be killed. Um, some there were, there were accounts of some squares losing so many men that entire regiments were just reduced to a few dozen troops by the end of the battle. You know, this was just how vicious this fighting was at this time. Um, but yeah, so what what this shows is that, that this is what the French should have done to begin with. They should have taken La Haisant first before launching any cavalry attacks at all, because then they could at least support them with artillery and infantry. Had they done that, it may have turned out differently, who knows? 
it begins to seem that if Wellington's army doesn't retreat, it will be killed where it stands. But the situation for Napoleon is also desperate. The Prussians are arriving in force, and he's running out of men to throw against Wellington's army. So he turns to his ultimate reserve, the elite Imperial Guard, the most feared troops in Europe. At 7.30 p.m., 3,000 of these battle-hardened veterans march past their Emperor and across the corpse-strewn battlefield towards the Allied centre. Wellington's redcoats rise to meet them and pour devastating volleys of musket fire into their ranks. When the Allies fix bayonets and prepare to charge, the Imperial Guard wavers and then retreats. Wellington, sensing victory, orders a general advance. About the same time, the Prussians recapture Plans Noir. News of the Imperial Guard's defeat and rumours of encirclement by the Prussians sweep through the French ranks. Panic breaks out and the French army flees the battlefield. Only Napoleon's old guard maintain their discipline, mounting a heroic but doomed rearguard action. Napoleon himself is forced to abandon his carriage and barely escapes the pursuing Prussian cavalry. So just a quick point, and I'm skipping back sort of a little bit here, but the French guards attack on Wellington's army. Um, you might have heard of a British army regiment called the Grenadier Guards, which is one of the regiments, um, I believe, that serves as the Royal Guard. You know, the soldiers who stand outside Buckingham Palace, they kind of, it's, um, I think they're a mixed they, they have troops from the different guards regiments. So there's the Coldstream Guards, the Irish Guards, the Scots Guards, Welsh Guards, people, you know, regiments like that. There's a regiment called the Grenadier Guards, which you may have heard of. And that actually got its name because there was a regiment of uh, foot guards, which is what they were known as at this time, um, around the time of the Battle of Waterloo, which were seen as, you know, the elite of the elite of the British infantry. And they were, you know, deployed um, as guards regiments for the, you know, for the monarch. And... Um, they were often deployed in London. It was kind of the British equivalent, I suppose, of like the Praetorian Guard, you know, of um, the Roman Empire. Um, so they often um, didn't necessarily see much uh, service compared to sort of more regular army regiments. But when they did, they generally acquitted themselves really well. Um, one of these guards regiments flung back what they thought were the grenadiers of the um, old guard, I believe, of the French army. Um, I don't think that was actually the case. I think they mistook the uniforms, but it, you know, that that legend just kind of stuck. And um, because they thought they had defeated the Grenadiers of the French Guards, um, they were allowed to take the name Grenadier Guards. So that's actually where um, they get their name from. So just a little tidbit there. The battle is won. The Duke of Wellington and Prince Blücher meet and congratulate each other outside Napoleon's former headquarters, an inn called La Belle Alliance. Blücher thinks it's the perfect name for their shared victory, but Wellington prefers the more English-sounding Waterloo, where he has his own headquarters. I do kind of like the name La Belle Alliance, though, because I, I think it translates to something like the good friendship or something like that, which is... Um, kind of a perfect name really um because it symbolizes that the friendship between wellington and blucher um but in, an interesting note actually which is that when wellington and blucher i don't think they had actually met before i think they probably will have met during the congress of vienna and stuff like that um but up until sort of very recently they hadn't really known each other but when they met after the battle of waterloo um obviously blucher uh, spoke German, but he couldn't speak English. Um, Wellington obviously spoke English, but he couldn't speak German, but they both spoke French fluently. So that's actually how they communicated with each other. Um, neither one could speak the other's mother tongue, but they could both speak French. So just a little interesting thing of note there. 
The Battle of Waterloo was, in the words of the Duke of Wellington, a damned near-run thing. It was also one of the bloodiest battles of the age. Around 50,000 men were killed or wounded, 23,000 coalition casualties, 27,000 French. Due to an appalling shortage of medical care, many of the wounded were left lying on the battlefield for several days. One of the very grisly things as well is that after um, the battle was over, there's so many dead and wounded lying out on the field. Um, the civilians and bandits and, and people like that start to roam about the battlefield looting uh, stuff. But one of the very more grisly things is that many people actually start removing the teeth of the dead and wounded soldiers. Um, and the reason why is because they were used as false teeth for people with dental issues back in the day. So if back in the, you know, back in the early 19th century, if you had a tooth extracted and you had like a false, quote unquote, false tooth put in, it was very likely a tooth that was previously owned by someone else. So, yeah. Napoleon was utterly defeated. Unable to raise another army, he surrendered to the British. They transported him to a second... Yeah, he surrendered to Captain Maitland of the HMS Bellerophon, which was uh, part of the blockading force that was keeping uh, the French ports blockaded. So, um, I think the Bellerophon was a ship of the line. You know, it was one of the big warships, um, comparable to something like HMS Victory. Um, and, you know, he uh, initially, um, Napoleon hoped to get to a French port to escape to America. Um, he hoped to potentially go to the United States. Um, obviously, the United States, until very recently, was hostile. He'd have been fighting a war against Britain. So he, it was hoped that he would be welcomed there. When that turned out that, he, you know, he wouldn't be able to do that. Um, the other thing that he asked for was actually an apartment in London. <laughs> he wanted to live in London for the remainder of his life. Um, but that was declined too. You know, I think after he had escaped from Elba the first time, the Allies just weren't having any of it at this point. Second exile on the tiny remote Atlantic island of St. Helena. This time there was no escape. He died there six years later. Ostensibly from stomach cancer, um, but there are many people who believe that he may have been poisoned. Um, but also the um, the guards that they had placed on St. Helena was um, indicative of the British never wanting him to escape again, because I think there was something like a thousand soldiers on this island, and there were two heavily armed warships that were constantly circling. And I think when he was buried, the, he was buried in like four different coffins or something ridiculous like that. He was like placed in a normal wooden coffin, which was then, you know, sealed with, you know, inside a lead coffin, inside another coffin. And then, you know, it was just, it was, all, it was almost like they was afraid his corpse would somehow rise from the ground and start another war or something. Um, but I think they just wanted, really wanted to make sure that he wouldn't get out this time. Waterloo marked the beginning of a period of relative peace in Europe. There were no wars between the great powers for 40 years, and the British would not fight on the continent for another 100 years, until the summer of 1914. That's, no, that's not entirely accurate, because the British did fight on the continent again. They, they fought in the Crimea, which is part of Europe. You know. The European boundary is kind of like around, sort of around there, you know, where the western sort of quarter, I suppose, of Russia ends. So British troops absolutely did fight on the... I think what he means is sort of around this bit, you know, the sort of western Europe. But British troops absolutely did fight on the continent again. Um, they fought in the Crimean War, like I said, uh, which was the British, Ottomans, French... Um, I think it, there was a few other nations involved as well um, against the Russians. Um, and there was a very large British expeditionary force that took part in that war, and that's actually the war that gave us Florence Nightingale, and um, because she um, popularised the horrific conditions that British troops were languishing in um, at this time, and that's kind of like what made battle, for, you know, her and Mary Seacole, um, who is, 
very sadly more often forgotten um she was a jamaican british jamaican nurse who served alongside uh, florence and was just as instrumental as florence was in sort of raising awareness of battlefield uh, conditions for um the wounded um potentially it may be the fact that she was um a black lady that is the reason why we don't remember in history um because obviously at the time there was even today sadly um but especially at the time um there was ob obviously a huge amount of racism in um society so maybe that's the reason um but um yeah i just wanted to offer that correction so british troops did fight on the continent they fought in the crimean war Forty years after the battle, a pioneer in the new art of photography captured these remarkable images. They're veterans of Napoleon's armies, by then all old men in their 70s and 80s. Among them, Sergeant Tanya of the Imperial Guard, Moray of the 2nd Regiment of Hussars, and Verlin of the 2nd Guard Lancers. These faces are a tantalizing link to the dramatic events that shaped the course of history two centuries ago. That's incredible. I didn't realize that there were so many high quality photos. There are a few photos of British veterans as well. You may have seen one. Um, there's a British soldier with his wife and he was a veteran of the Peninsula War. There's that photo going about. But that's incredible that they got so many really good quality photos, especially for the time. You know, these photographs are a really good quality um but it's just fascinating because you know you read about battles you know for example in the roman empire you know or even as late as something like the american revolution and it's often easy to forget that these were people that were involved because you know there, there's no videos obviously of this time there's um, there were no photographs contemporaneously of these wars because photography didn't really exist at this time or if it I can't remember when photography was invented but it didn't really become a thing until sort of the mid 19th century um, so you, you, you tend to forget that these were real people and they become more statistics and you know facts and figures on a page so it's often you often like lose that human connection to it um so to see these photographs is a wonderful reminder of that that you know these were human beings you know these were um you know it, it wasn't just a thing that happened you know it was people that was involved in this you know people like you and me so um it's fantastic to have that link to history wherever we can um you know, just uh, speaking of the American Revolution, I think the same thing happened there because photography was in its infancy, sort of like around this time, and there were veterans of the American Revolution still, you know, they're still around at this time, obviously, um, and people did the same thing with them. They, um, they got some photographs of veterans who, by this time, were very old men. They were in the seventies and eighties. You know, this was around, sort of. I think it was probably around the 1820s, 30s, probably, um, when photography was very, very new. And they got interviews with them. You know, they um, recorded what they said. You know, so it's it's incredible to think that we still have those links to history wherever we can. So, um, yeah, just something there to remember. Oh, <laughs> I guess that's the end of the video. So, yeah, that was a good video. Um, like I say, it's um, this is the culmination of our Napoleonic Wars series, but we do have the compendium video of Napoleon's Marshals to go up as well. So um, there will be that coming after this one. Um, like I say, I have been out, out of the loop for a couple of weeks, but I do know that Kings and Generals have also released a couple of new videos on the Ukraine war, so I will be doing those. I'll do those as sort of specials, you know, so those will just be released as and when. Um, it won't be a Wednesday or Friday thing, that will be for other reaction content, um, but um, yeah, I can see what people mean by, you know, it's not as in-depth as his other um, videos on the topic, you know, I think had this been made um, after the other series that he did, it probably would have been two or three times as long. Um, but still, as always, it was a great video. Um, some people have recommended to me the History Marsh video on Waterloo, um, which includes much more about the intelligence and the manoeuvring that took place um, in the lead up to the battle. So I'll probably check that one out too. 
um, as a sort of addition to this one. So I might release that um, as a special as well, rather than a fixed Wednesday or Friday thing. So, um, But as always, thank you all so much for watching. Please check out my Patreon as well. There's a link to that in the description. The more people that I get supporting me, um, the more content I'll be able to create because uh, as I say I'd love to turn this into a job you know for this to become a full-time job would be absolutely amazing so uh, please check out um, that too but in the meantime thank you all so much for watching and I shall see you all on the next one